for this month. Art Wright, who is associate professor at Baptist Theological Seminary, who are graduating their last class wow. this year. So if anybody knows of a position <laughs> or a you're a you're associate professor of spirituality and New Testament. So if anybody has any connections out there and at VCU or Richmond or anywhere, Art is available and ready to chat. I am on the market. On the market. On the market. <laughs> and has a very good resume. So we're going to be talking about heaven, hell, and the afterlife. Uh, so so exciting topic. Thank you, Art. Thank you. All yours. Thanks. Well, it's so good to be back with you all. I was I looked at my calendar this morning because I was trying to remember when I was with y'all last April. We went through the Gospel of John trying to make points of contact with the Roman Empire in that Gospel and had a great time. Um, and I, I think we're going to have a good time. Y'all are a fun class. Uh, I think we'll have a good time with this topic. Uh, I was thinking about it this past week. You know, Ash Wednesday is this coming Wednesday. Uh, Ash Wednesday, uh, a day to reflect on our own mortality. And then we enter into the Lenten season. Uh, sort of the most somber period in the life of the church calendar. So, so I think a wholly appropriate, appropriate topic to bite off. It can be a heavy topic at times, but also a fun topic too, surprisingly enough. Um, so I'm excited to, to talk to you all about it. Um, a couple of goals I have for us uh, as we wade into this topic. Uh, one, to help us think critically about the afterlife and our beliefs about it. Two, to think about why it matters that we talk about this topic. Uh, and then three, to look specifically at what the biblical texts do say and don't say about this topic. Uh, and a little bit of a spoiler up front, they might not say exactly <coughs> what we think they say, uh, which is one of the reasons we'll, we'll do a lot of looking at, at the biblical texts. I do recognize this is a sensitive topic for most of us. Uh, the beliefs we hold about the afterlife are actually near and dear to us, whether we realize it or not. All of us have loved ones who have died, and all of us have things we, we very much want to believe about their fate. Uh, so, so I'm going to attempt to walk a careful line with this series. Uh, we want to have a critical approach to what the biblical texts say. This is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible doesn't say. But also be sensitive to all of our beliefs. I imagine that they're diverse in this room, right? Um, I'll share a lot of different ideas. Uh, some of them I believe, some of them I don't believe. I just want to try to say here's what's out there on this topic. Uh, but the truth is, none of us know for sure <laughs> what happens on the other side of death. Uh, that's a promise. I won't tell you the answers uh, in, this, in this series. That's why we invited you Sorry. here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, answer. Uh, well, maybe we'll schedule a field trip a couple of times. <laughs> Um, if I say something that, that doesn't sit well with you, that's okay. You don't have to believe uh, what I say. If someone else in the room says something that doesn't sit with you, that's okay too. It's okay that we have different views and different beliefs on this topic. Uh, and so let's just be gracious to one another as we wait in. Let me give you an overview of where, <coughs> where we're going to attempt to go uh, during this four-week course. Um, this week we're going to talk about some introductory matters try to set some big questions on the table, kind of help us get oriented to, to the topic. Uh, and also, if we have time, uh, wade into Egyptian and Mesopotamian, ancient Egyptian and ancient Mesopotamian beliefs about the afterlife. One, because they're kind of fun and interesting. And two, because they, they provide uh, a, a helpful contrast to the biblical perspectives. It's, it's hard to um, examine the, the biblical texts without sort of thinking, what else is out there at the time? And so this will kind of tell us what's in the cultural waters of beliefs about the afterlifes. Next week, we're going to look at what the Old Testament says about the afterlife. Uh, we'll use the word Sha'ol a lot. This is the Egyptian, uh, sorry, the, the, um, the ancient Hebrew understanding of the abode of the dead, uh, somewhat analogous to Hades. Week three, we'll talk about hell at length. 
uh, I'll share three traditional views of hell in Christian history. And then week four, um, I'll fly away, question mark, notice that sneaky little question mark, uh, we'll re revisit the biblical perspective on heaven. So that's sort of how I've mapped out this series for us. <clears throat> so why talk about it? I think there are two tendencies among churches. I'm wondering which, which y'all fall into. On the one hand, uh, some churches don't talk about the afterlife much at all. Uh, and I think in this case, we don't really have a genuine, coherent theology of the afterlife that informs our faith and practice. Uh, and then the other tendency is, uh, I, I think many churches probably fall into this trap, they talk about it too much to the exclusion of any concerns about, uh, about uh, this life. You've accepted Jesus, fantastic. You're going to heaven. We don't really care about uh, your life here, if you're poor, whether you have anything to eat or not. Uh, all that matters is that you're going to heaven in the grand scheme of things, right? So these are the, the sort of two tendencies uh, that, that we have in churches. I think my, my church probably tends towards this first tendency. Uh, I don't know, do y'all, where do you think that your ch church lands on this? Tendency one, tendency two? One. 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 That's what I would guess, yeah, that's sort of, from what I know about y'all. So we'll try to thread the needle here between these two tendencies. We're gonna talk about the afterlife because our beliefs about it do matter. Uh, our questions and our, our understandings of the afterlife are, are matters of ultimate concern. Uh, and the answers, the answers that we arrive at may have profound implications for our understanding of the afterlife. But beyond that, and more importantly, I think we have to talk about the afterlife because our beliefs about it have profound implications for how we live this life, both as individuals and as a church. So our beliefs about the afterlife and our lives in this world are not mutually exclusive. So that's, that's what I'm going to press you on. I think that what we think about the afterlife matters for this life. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, functions and implications of our beliefs about the afterlife. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a, a smattering of these and see if you can think of any too along the way. And uh, let me say, if you have questions or, or comments that pop up along the way, feel free to raise your hand and we'll try to sneak you in. Uh, so first of all, our afterlife beliefs have a pastoral function. Our beliefs about the afterlife affect how we feel about and react to death. Uh, typically, they offer comfort to those of us that are left behind in the wake of loss. So let me ask you, what are some things that people say after a loved one dies? They're in a better, They're a better place. place. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's a very particular afterlife belief that sets behind that, right? What else? Can you think of any others? Go nope. home. They've gone home. No more pain. No more pain. Absolutely. No more tears. No more tears. Yeah. They left the world a better place. Okay. Yeah. They're with people that they have died already. Yes, they're they've gone to be parents, with loved ones. Yes, yeah, so or God has <coughs> called home an angel or something. Uh, they're with God now. All of these are sort of the the result of specific uh, <coughs> beliefs about the afterlife. They also have a powerful pastoral effect. Uh, they help us feel better in the wake of loss while we're grieving, okay? Uh, I taught a course on this a couple years ago, and, and um, with my class, we developed a survey. And we blasted it out on Facebook and ended up getting a thousand some responses, which is pretty fun. Uh, but 75% of the people that responded said that they hoped that they would see their loved ones after death. Or, the, or, uh, or they believe they would see their loved ones after death. 75% is pretty remarkable. Uh, they also function to manage our own fears about death, right? If we sit and dwell on this a little too long, it, it, it can make many of us anxious. Studies suggest that our beliefs about the afterlife affect an anxiety and depression uh, we might feel about death. If we feel confident that death is not the final end, uh, we tend not to worry about it quite so much, curiously enough. I uh, dug this one quote out. Uh, the day we fear as our last is but the birthday of eternity, uh, Seneca. <clears throat> right. So they also serve an ethical function. 
if you believe that good behavior leads to certain rewards in the afterlife, you're going to act a certain way. Or the tendency. Uh, Baptists tend to say certain things about that. Uh, there are different types of Baptists. Uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you think that bad behavior leads to bad outcomes in the afterlife, there are going to be certain things you avoid, right? So they, they shape our ethics and our way of living in the world. Uh, they might help us live virtuously to avoid certain actions. Um, I pulled out a quote from uh, a, a pastor, Gabriel Saguero, in New York City. Uh, he says, I think the calling of eternity for me, what I, what I tell my parishioners is that the view of eternity should serve an, as an ethical imperative, or in the words of Jesus of Nazareth in his prayer, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in Saguero's view, if you believe heaven is like, such and such, then you should be living your life to make that a reality here as well. <clears throat> uh, the flip side of the, this, there's certain extremist cases um, uh, where uh, people's afterlife beliefs influence people to do great, great evil in the world. Uh, radical Islam, radical Christianity, other sort of like fringe um, religious groups that don't fall within the mainstream of their religion, but they have hold particular beliefs about the afterlife that, that uh, cause them to, to inflict great harm on people. Okay. Uh, I also have wondered if um, maybe environmental ethics uh, come out of some of our afterlife <clears throat> beliefs. If you think, oh, uh, heaven is my home, you know, I'm going to die and leave here one day, you might have a tendency not to recycle as much or, or care for the earth. Uh, in, in all seriousness, right? Uh, I'm, I'm out of here. It doesn't matter what sort of state we leave the earth in after I die. Okay? All right. Uh, let's see. It shapes the proclamation and message of the church. Uh, what do we preach about on Sunday morning? What, do, what does your pastor preach about? And you'll have a new pastor, a senior mm -hmm. pastor, right? So all the you need to come to church. I need to. <laughs> <laughs> She's not preaching. To oh, she's all right. It's the children's music. Okay. Okay. Need to come I'll to come sometime. <laughs> or catch a podcast or something. So what do we preach about on Sunday morning? Is uh, is your new pastor a hellfire and brimstone preacher? I'm guessing probably not. Uh, but there are plenty of them out there. Uh, it, uh, does she preach about how to live and follow Jesus in this life? Uh, it affects what we think the gospel is, what we think the good news is. Uh, is, is the good news that in, in Jesus, God has revealed how to live in right relationship with one another and with God? Is, it, uh, is the good news that Jesus died on the cross as an atoning sacrifice, and that by believing in him we escape the fires of hell? Uh, is it perhaps that the kingdom of God is drawing near and is, is already at hand? Uh, so, so what we believe about the afterlife influences what we think the good news is, the gospel is, all right? It affects the mission of the church. Uh, our afterlife beliefs affect what we do as a church, what we think our relevance is within the greater community. So I imagine two churches uh, sending out two very different mission groups. Uh, one group is going to go to a, maybe a poor area of the country or maybe another country, uh, and everything they do is going to be oriented towards saving souls, right? If they, you know, build a school or if they engage in mission projects, uh, it's all oriented to get them to believe in Jesus. If they come back and no one has professed faith in Christ, they're going to come back disappointed, I think. Another church is going to send out a mission group, maybe to the same place, they're going to be building schools or, or whatever, uh, engaging in uh, maybe medical care. Uh, they don't care if the people come to believe in Jesus. They just want to build God's kingdom on earth, thinking that this is going to make the world a better place. Two different churches, two very different understandings of the afterlife at work, shaping their mission engagement in the world. All right. All right. Uh, just a small handful more. Uh, our uh, it affects our theology. Our afterlife beliefs sort of bleed over into all areas of our theology. For example, uh, do you believe that God is all sovereign? I'm going to put you on the spot for this. Do you, yeah, do you believe that God is all sovereign? If so, can you believe that God's reign also might extend to hell? 
uh, can, can you believe that Satan reigns in hell and also believe that God is all sovereign? Mm -hmm. See how that, that belief affects this other belief? Uh, is God a loving God? Is God a just God? Does God demand <laughs> holiness and punish people for wrongdoing? Do we have free will to choose our own actions and consequences? <laughs> So our, our, our beliefs about the afterlife affect who we think God is and what we think God's nature is. Uh, I could go on and on and on. Um, uh, social implications of our afterlife beliefs. Our afterlife beliefs and the language we use to talk about heaven and hell bind us together as communities. It creates insider language, so to speak. Um, and creates and sustains our identity as a church. <coughs> it also draws lines around communities of faith, what we believe, and all of our theology does, but our afterlife theology certainly does too. Uh, so one example of this, uh, how do we engage in interfaith dialogue? How can we dialogue uh, with people of a different faith? Uh, if you think that the final destination of the person sitting across the table from you is different than your final destination, uh, it's going to affect how you can engage in a relationship with them. What, what sort of relationship can First Presbyterian Church have with the Islamic Center of Richmond, for example, uh, depending on your afterlife beliefs? Okay. Two more, uh, and these are, these are quick. Uh, it affects our liturgy and worship. It affects the songs we sing in worship. Uh, and the scriptures we read. And finally, uh, other. Uh, it affects, for example, uh, some very practical issues, like what we do with a, a, a deceased person's body. Uh, do we bury them whole? Do we cremate them? Do we set them on a raft, shove it off, and then light them on fire? Uh, what we believe about the afterlife influences how we treat and bury our dead. Okay. Uh, so all that to say, what we believe about the afterlife affects how we live this life. Uh, and what we believe as a church, what you all as believe as a church about the afterlife, has profound implications for the life of the church. Okay. May I ask a question? Please do. <coughs> and it's somewhat naive. Uh, are we saying you cannot be a Christian unless you believe in the afterlife? Uh, I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that all Christians have some beliefs about what happens after death. Uh, and I have certainly met a plenty of Christians uh, who think that, you know, you die and your legacy is sort of your immortality. Um, I know a lot of Christians who have no earthly idea what to believe about the afterlife. Uh, and it's just sort of, you know, a, a, a question mark. I have a great um, quote from N.T. Wright uh, that I'll share week, the fourth week. Um, he says, all of our um, beliefs about the afterlife are signs pointing into the midst. It doesn't show what, uh, what we will find when we arrive, but it sort of points to this hazy future. So, uh, no, I, I don't think so. I think it's, uh, it's an open question. It's a good question. Well, <clears throat> this is not an answer, but as a Christian, I do believe there was an afterlife for Jesus. Okay, there you go. Uh, so I, I'm guessing you're talking about the resurrection or ascension. Do you want to say it? And sitteth on the right hand. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. resurrection, ascension, yeah. My hunch is that our, our beliefs about it are very diverse, even within this room of, of this one Sunday school class of this one church. Come to my church sometime and, you know, Baptists will have still different beliefs. Yes, sir? Well, you tell us <coughs> before it's all over what you personally believe. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good question. <laughs> I feel like I need to have a pop quiz or something. <laughs> um, I will be as honest. Yeah, it, it, it puts one in a very vulnerable position to talk about your beliefs about the afterlife. Um, I will be as honest as I, I feel. Uh, and I, you know, I think I can probably be pretty honest. Um, and I am one of those people that have a great question mark around the afterlife. I have a great deal of humility about it. Uh, I can tell you what the Bible says, 
but then I still sort of um, have this, you know, this is this is what Paul is guessing and what the the author of the Gospel of John is guessing. Uh, I, I do think it is a grand mystery. Um, so I I'm reticent to sort of pin things down, if that makes sense. But I'll be honest, if, if you ask me. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll tell you, for example, week, week three where I fall on the health question, if you ask me, just remind me. The great questions, any other questions? All right, well, we're doing good so far. <laughs> How are we doing on time? I should be we're good. watching this. We're good. We're good. We're good. good. All right. Um, let's keep rolling then. Um, I'll come back to this question at the end if we have time. So let's let's talk a little bit. Um, next week we'll wade into the Old Testament. I want to sort of talk about what's in the cultural waters of that time and that era before we <coughs> jump into next week. So we're going to look at um, ancient Egyptian views of the afterlife and ancient Mesopotamian views. Uh, one caveat, I'm not an expert on either of these areas. I'm a Bible scholar. So it would be much comfortable weeks two, three, and four, much more comfortable. Um, most of this information comes from a book by Alan Siegel called Life After Death. It's about 800 pages long. If I remember, I'll bring it one week. It's a great book, but man, it is hard to get through. <laughs> but I think it helps uh, it helps to see what other people thought at the time to draw a contrast to what we'll see in the biblical texts. Uh, and, and, and I think helps sharpen what we think, too. Um, so let's jump into Egypt. Uh, and so this is Egyptian history at a glance. Uh, I've, I've delineated six different periods, starting as far back as 3000 BCE, uh, so well before the, um, the Israelite people. Uh, when we're talking, for example, King David, King Solomon, that's about 1000 BC, um, if that's helpful to orient. And this goes almost 3000 years of history to 322 when Alexander the Great comes in and conquers, and he uh, establishes the, um, the Ptolemy dynasty, okay, that you may have uh, heard of. A lot happens in 3,000 years, right? <laughs> Think about what was happening 3,000 years ago from today. Uh, and the views of the afterlife in Egypt evolve significantly over this time. Uh, it, the evolution of their afterlife beliefs is especially evident, for example, in the location of the afterlife. Uh, early Egyptian beliefs tend to center on the sky as the final resting place of the dead. Uh, later Egyptians believed that the, the sort of final afterlife location is underground in the realm of Osiris. Okay? So a big shift from where you go when you die. Uh, and I'll point out some other, some other shifts. All right? Uh, so let's, let's talk about some key Egyptian words. Uh, you've probably heard of the, the Egyptian word an ankh. Uh, an ankh is uh, the Egyptian word for life. It refers to a regularly, regularly ordered, patterned, unanxious life. Okay? And then, uh, actually, I think you can see it right here, an ankh, this symbol right there. And then ma'at personifies this order as justice. Ma'at is depicted uh, as a fragile feather or a, a, a lovely young goddess wearing a single feather in her headdress. <coughs> so you can see this feather right here. So this is the goddess Ma'at, all right? Symbolizing order and justice. Ma'at uh, helps to regulate this ordered life. She, she helps prevent creation from devolving into chaos. Uh, and she helps weigh souls in the underworld. I'll show you an image in a couple slides. She weighs her souls against her feather to see if they can successfully go on to the, to the, to the good afterlife. All right? Now, Pharaoh, uh, he is a, a character who's considered both human and divine. Uh, he plays a central role on earth in the maintenance of ma'at, justice and order. Uh, and, and he con helps control and restrain chaos during life. Uh, so that everything is well and good in Egyptian society, all right? Uh, once he dies, uh, he ascends to the heavens and dwells among the stars, and Egy ancient Egyptians believed that even in death, he continued 
to have a role in maintaining ma'at, all right, this justice and orderly life. All right, let me check my slides here. Okay, not quite there yet. So in the early Egyptian period, the earliest Egyptian period, only the Pharaoh had a shot at immortality, and he was actually an automatic end. Uh, <laughs> lucky guy. Uh, partly because he was human and divine, right? Uh, that sort of punches his ticket, but he's necessary for the maintenance of ma'at in the, in the afterlife. As time passes in Egyptian uh, society, there's this um, sense that there's a democratization of the afterlife where more and more people gain access to the afterlife, all right? So if Pharaoh's gonna go to the afterlife, well, don't you think he should have a wife in the afterlife? Don't you think he needs some advisors? Don't you think he needs servants? And so you can kind of see the circle kind of grows and grows and grows. And over time, eventually, most everyone has a shot at, at gaining access to this beatific uh, good afterlife. All right? Uh, here's the thing, though. The Pharaoh got an automatic pass. What about this, this other group of people? If we're going to let all these other people in the afterlife, we sort of have to figure out who's in and who's out. And so now, now ethics become the way of determining uh, who's in and who's out. The way you lived your life matters, all right? So there, there's this um, understanding of an afterlife journey. Uh, you go on this journey in the afterlife to, to see if you can gain uh, a beatific afterlife, all right? So let me break down briefly what some of the Egyptian beliefs are. Uh, there's different Egyptian terms for components of a person. We're going to talk a little bit in the weeks to come about our, our understandings of this too. We tend to think body and soul, I think, is sort of the two common things that we as Christians believe. Uh, Egyptians believed in a number of them. Two, two important ones, the ba and the ka. The ba is sort of like a soul. It's the characteristics of a person that make a per each person unique. And it's depicted by a human-headed bird. So you can see the ba leaving the body at death here in this image. One of <laughs> this, <laughs> these terms get a little ridiculous. But one of the goals of the afterlife in, in ancient Egypt is to re reunite your ba with your ka so you can become an ak. <laughs> so, um, so the ka is the life force or vital spark of a person. This is what makes someone alive, all right? At death, it separates from the body, but still lives in the tomb of a person. Uh, often you would see like uh, a statue or a portrait with the image of the living person with a tomb, and this is um, what relatives would uh, bring food offerings to, okay? Uh, and then the ak, you're trying to get your ba and your ka reunited to become an ak. An ak is a blessed spirit or a glorious spirit. This is the state a person reaches when they have successfully completed all of the steps of the <coughs> afterlife journey. Uh, ritual purification, mummification, burial, spells, and then a successful underworld journey. And then a, a, a moot is uh, basically the opposite of an ak. It's just basically a corpse. So you either become an ak, an ak, or a corpse, basically. All right. All right. So, are you with me? This is, <laughs> okay. Y'all are doing really At least good. Those words all like rhyme, like ah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Duat is the underworld which Osiris ruled. Okay. Uh, most of this information comes from the Egyptian Book of the Dead, so if you are interested in following up on this, uh, that's where you want to go, uh, among other sources. So after death, a person's ba faces a number of supernatural dangers, obstacles, and a series of gates that they have to pass in the underworld. Uh, and for example, they have to um, answer these 42 negative confessions truthfully. Uh, which gives you a little bit of a sense of their ethical standards. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some, uh, not because I believe in them, but because it gives you a sense of what they're being asked to do in the underworld journey. So I have not committed robbery with violence. Uh, I have not committed sin. I have not stolen. I have not slain men and women. I have not uttered lies. Uh, I have not lain with men. I have made none to weep. I have not debauched the wife of any man. I have not stolen 
the property of the gods. I have not worked, worked witchcraft against the Pharaoh. All right. <coughs> How many of you would pass? <laughs> I don't know that I can make it through that. All lesson. the eyes, I assume, are male. <laughs> uh, that, well, so yeah, you can see the um, the sort of patriarchal slant of that culture, and Old Testament and New Testament to a large degree uh, shares that as well, right? Uh, women are understood as property in, the, in most cases. The uh, Book of the De Dead is that something that they compiled over time or is it just someone wrote it all of a sudden or how did that come about yeah this is where this is outside of my realm of expertise okay. but my my understanding is that it is something that um accumulated over time and so that, uh you know there's different presentations and perspectives um uh there's pro i don't think there's even just one copy available but there's probably different uh different versions of it, too. Uh, I mean, and, uh, there's a lot of rules and regulations as compared to, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on the dead, so um, this book seems really uh, unique uh, as compared to other um, Yeah, yeah, look, go look it up on Wikipedia or something after church today, and yeah, it's, it's interesting. All right, so if you pass all of these gates and so forth, uh, if you pass all these obstacles, you come to the final judgment. And this is where <laughs> your heart gets weighed against the ostrich feather of Ma'at. So remember we saw the feather a couple slides ago. Here's the heart, and here's the ostrich feather. So, and in, and, uh, in different um, sources, uh, in some of them you have to balance with Ma'at. So you have this ordered, uh, balanced life. In some, your heart has to be lighter than the feather in order to pass this final judgment. But, but it gets weighed against ma'at. Um, and if you pass this, if your ba successfully completes the underworld journey and judgment, then you become an ak and go, go on to live a blissful afterlife in the realm of Osiris. Uh, if you fail, your ba is eaten by Amit, the, de uh -oh, the devourer of souls. All right. <laughs> Uh, so that's what you're up against. <laughs> Pretty amazing that they knew exactly what was going to happen. You know, like someone took the, the, you know, went through the whole steps and came back and said, oh, this is what's going to happen, so this, this is what you need to do. Yeah. So, yeah. It does make you wonder how much of it is certainty on their part and how much is um, symbolic and, and sort of a, a guess. I, I don't know. But yeah, I think you're right. So let me make a, a couple of points about this before we move on to Mesopotamia. Um, so neutral death versus moral death. Neutral death, the understanding that everyone's uh, death and what awaits on the other side is the same. Uh, our, how we live this life doesn't have any bearing on our death. Versus moral death, the understanding that um, our morality, our ethics, and our, our life has a bearing on the outcome of our death. We see that shift over 3,000 years of history in ancient Egypt, okay? Does that make sense? We'll come back to this next week. Um, for the most part, this is a spoiler, um, but for the most part in the Old Testament, they have an understanding of neutral death, uh, where everyone's fate is the same. Do you think that from the very beginning, <clears throat> Man has just been born with some innate longing for something after. In other words, they see a friend of theirs or a family member, just they're dead. Their life has stopped. Mm -hmm. they're, they, they don't. And I just wonder if from the very beginning, what has brought about this belief mm -hmm. and everyone's different <coughs> from, yeah. from time immemorial <coughs> i think Whether so man is just born with some innate longing for something to keep life going i do think so and i haven't to be honest i haven't studied the psychology of it but i think probably from the the beginning when um humanity understood death and the finality of death, there has been this longing for something more and this um, hope. And so we see afterlife beliefs in, I think, most all cultures. Um, I'm just showing you a, a, you know, a couple over these next four weeks, but it is 
uh, certainly pervasive in, in humanity from an, a very early time. Second point, um, over thousands of years, we see quite a bit of de development in Egyptian thought about the afterlife. Alan Siegel says, from, from our vantage point of time, we see from the immensely long history of Egypt that even heaven has a history. Okay? That's true for us, too. All right? If you think about 2,000 year, years ago to today, Christian beliefs about the, afterlife, af about the afterlife have continued to evolve over that time, too. Uh, very often responsive to our own context and, and what's going on in the world. So this is a key takeaway. We, we need to uh, see that afterlife beliefs evolve, right? Okay. We'll pause for just a second, just to see if yeah. Supporting Marilyn's argument, I I think you could find thirteen thousand years ago in North America and South America, Central America, people being buried with <clears throat> with golden objects and mm. uh, iron objects and uh, that. That it's uh, so. Why why would they do that? Yeah. If they weren't trying to assist that person. You're right. Into the future, they, I mean, because these things were valuable then. They still needed to protect themselves, and they the gold had value. So right. Yeah. There's some sort of afterlife up. belief operating there that uh, influences how they bury. But, the as much as ten thousand years before this. Right. Yeah. Right. I don't know how. I don't know when people started burying people, but I imagine it's yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, let's jump into ancient Mesopotamian beliefs, um, and this this is a much more pessimistic view of the afterlife. Here's the basic thrust: uh, humans can't live forever like the gods. Heaven is only for the gods, and humans cannot go there. Okay. All the dead go below to the underworld. They sort of live on in this like ghost-like state. Uh, and there's a very privileged few that are even given a glimpse of heaven where the gods dwell. So the dominant advice about death and the afterlife in ancient Mesopotamian society was resignation and acceptance. Okay? Can I go? Okay. Yeah. So what you're saying, though, is there's still a belief about an afterlife, it's just sort of the quality of it. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah, death is right. not the end, we just, um, but only the gods have the glorious yes. afterlife, but still that thought of there is something <clears throat> next. Yes, yes, absolutely, and we'll see that next week too, uh, but but the, the advice is enjoy this life while it lasts, <laughs> okay? Um, so, uh, this information is going to come from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which may sound familiar to some of you. There's a, um, often when, you, when we talk about Noah in churches, there's a famous flood story in the Epic of Gilgamesh that's a, a significant point of connection between the, um, the Genesis flood and uh, Mesopotamian culture. Uh, it's a great Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian epic of loss and bereavement. It's uh, roughly 2000 BCE. Uh, and so the main character, Gilgamesh, is this wild, oppressive king of the city of Uruk. Uh, and so the gods are nervous about him, and they end up creating this friend for him, who's also wild, Enkidu, uh, to in, in a, an effort to sort of help calm him. Um, they end up going on all these adventures together. Gilgamesh sort of becomes the hero par excellence of Mesopotamian culture. Uh, eventually, they upset the gods, and the um, and Enkidu ends up dying. Uh, what happens is something like this: uh, there's a goddess who is evidently romantically attracted to Gilgamesh. I guess he's very good looking or something. He spurns her romantic advances, uh, and she sends the bull of heaven to punish him. Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Uh, end up killing the bull of heaven, which I would suggest is not a very good idea. <laughs> um, I guess they didn't have many options. So to punish them, the gods sentence Enkidu to death, and he ends up dying of, of illness. Uh, and in that culture, you'd much rather die gloriously in battle. So he'd die sort of like a, a weak death. Uh, Gilgamesh is uh, very, uh, very upset. He's full of grief. And so he, as a result, launches on this quest to find a remedy to death and somehow restore his friend to life. 
Um, and so a, a key point here, for Gilgamesh, his friend's death, there's a, a very real sense that um, this is the beginning of wisdom here, okay? Seeing uh, that law, life means eternal loss uh, provides this spark of wisdom. And really in all of the ancient Near Eastern cultures, uh, especially in the Old Testament, there's a connection between our understanding of mortality and wisdom. Like once you understand the finitude of human existence, only then can you, can you start to understand what it means to live a wise life. Uh, if you think back to Genesis 2, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you eat of this and you gain this knowledge, <coughs> then on the other side, inevitably, death will come. So those two concepts are married in Genesis as well. So Gilgamesh, uh, I'll try to <laughs> tell this story briefly. Uh, Gilgamesh journeys to the end of the earth to meet uh, Utnapishtim, and he is the, um, the equivalent of Noah. He's the one who built an ark to protect humans and animals from a flood. And so the gods did award him with immortality. So Gilgamesh thinks, well, I'll go talk to this guy. He knows how to become immortal. Uh, so Utnapishtim challenges Gilgamesh to a trial. He says, if you want to conquer death, <coughs> prove to me first that you can conquer sleep by staying awake for a whole week. All right? Uh, it's almost comical how miserably Gilgamesh fails. He falls asleep the first day and ends up sleeping the entire week. <laughs> uh, and I will be honest, I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old. Sometimes that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so he wants to conquer death, but he can't even conquer sleep. So it sort of shows how big of a joke it is to, to be able to conquer death. Uh, and so uh, the, the whole episode, uh, so he ends up defeated, he can't, it, it's, it's a long story, it's something like 12 tablets uh, long, but that's the gist of it. So it raises the question of human mortality and the hope for immortality and ends with s sort of this quiet acceptance and resignation of the fate that all humans uh, bear. Uh, it also ends, I think this uh, may be helpful to your line of thinking. It ends with a praise of culture. Uh, so Gilgamesh returns to his home city of, Ur <coughs> of Uruk and, uh, and praises it, saying this is, is the product of our achievement. This will stand the test of time. So there's this sense that culture is the legacy and immortality that humans can achieve. Uh, if you think about like artwork that humans have produced that have lasted through the ages, there's a sense that this is the immortality that, that humans are capable of achieving. So there's this, there's this um, sort of carpe diem speech from um, the barmaid goddess Siduri uh, that expresses this, this sort of resignation and acceptance most clearly. She says, as for you, Gilgamesh, let your belly be full, make merry day and night. Of each day, make a feast of rejoicing, day and night, dance and play, let your garments be sparkling fresh, your head be washed, bathed in water. Pay heed to the little one that holds onto your hand. Let a spouse delight in your bosom, for this is the task of a woman. So he's, uh, she's basically saying to Gilgamesh, give up your life <coughs> adventuring, settle down, marry, have kids, enjoy life. Uh, immortality is just not achievable for humans. Uh, enjoy the good stuff of life now while you still can. Uh, and we see a very similar sentiment expressed in Ecclesiastes. Uh, this will give us a little bit of a preview for next week. Uh, go and eat your bread with enjoyment, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has long ago approved what you do. Let your garments be white, let oil not be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with a wife whom you love, all the days of your vain life that are given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hands find to do, do with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going, so the, the place of the dead. Very similar, right? Um, well, this begs a question. I mean, sure. This, these societies were hundreds of miles apart. <laughs> Right? Yeah, hundreds, yeah. <laughs> hundreds of miles apart. I'm not sure exactly. Do you think possibly that there was some communication? I mean, even 
that these societies intermingled and culturally were involved with one another a little bit? Yeah, uh, I don't know enough about the specifics. I would say, sort of very generally, it's in the cultural water, you know. Uh, and Ecclesiastes was written um, uh, not quite 2,000 years after, you know, pen put to paper, uh, much later than the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh. But these are stories that would have been told in communities, and surely there were points of contact from culture to culture. Uh, this, this wouldn't have been um, the wisdom that everybody shared, but this was certainly common wisdom in the ancient Near East. So, yeah. Well, the, if no other contact, there were wars for territory against each other forever, as long as you're in sure, the territory. So yeah. the I, conqueror takes wives and or takes women and so on and so forth like that. So I'm yeah, I'm I'm sure there's influence and contact. I just I don't know how I would draw a straight line between the two. I don't think they copied the <coughs> epic of Gilgamesh, but I think that they're they're breathing the same cultural environment. Yeah. So yes sir. Well Abraham would be a creature of Mesopotamia. That's right, yeah, so he, he's a wanderer, a, a, he goes on a great journey and resettles, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so he would be one example, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to pause and open, I, I can uh, say a couple more things, but let me just kind of pause and open it up for questions or discussion or comments, uh, whatever we need to say or share. Yes, sir? Um, it, it seems like the Egyptians were into death, and the Mesopotamians were like, Let's find some method of becoming immortal. That's you know. So there was a difference, and um, and how they approached uh, death. One said, "Oh, here I got a book here with the instructions. And everything will be great if you follow these instructions. Once you're dead." The other people were like, oh, "Let's find some way of becoming immortal or fighting to find you know something like that." And then they came to a point where they said, "Oh, that's impossible. So we might as well give up this uh, quest." Right. Yeah, and the, so the and I I think that's one of the reasons sharing these two on the first day is is helpful. Is if you know in the Egyptian view, at least by the end of it, you can gain this um, glorious afterlife existence that's maybe better than this life. Uh, and on the flip side, the Mesopotamians, uh, yeah, they they maybe were desirous of some sort of immortality or afterlife, but in the end, they just believed that it wasn't wasn't for humans. To possess, so yeah, very sort of mor morose. It reminds me of that one of the first slides you showed of the two different ways we even handle it now. Is we talk about it all the time and focus on it, or we just kind of stay away from it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, different. Yeah, not, not a lot has changed. Right. <laughs> That's right. You know, yeah. an interesting thought on this is <coughs> human evolution. That at some point, humans started to understand death and that it would come, where you think about the animal kingdom, I don't know, but I wouldn't think any animals understand death is going to come until it happens, they understand that corpse does not live anymore. Right. And it gets back to your comment of with mortality comes wisdom, or yes. something you said along those lines, that at some point as we understood our mortality, then we became wise that this is the way it's going to work and this mm. is our demise at some point. Yeah. Which is, I mean, kind of goes way beyond or earlier than where you are. But when did we really start to understand <laughs> our, our mortality? Yeah, yeah. yeah and this is a, a a key difference between humans and and the rest of the animal kingdom. <clears throat> so we know we're going to die. To my knowledge, I, I'm not a biologist, but most, if not all, animals have no knowledge of their pending death. Until <clears throat> uh, and to, yeah, right. And then they, I, I don't think any animals bury. They're uh, dead, not, not that I'm aware of. Well, that's a key indicator. Um, I don't think there's any examples of an Australopithecus or a Ramaphithecus having burial rituals. And they don't know when awareness would have existed because they can't study thought. But when you see burial rituals, that's a clear indication of respect for the dead. Right. And so these burial rituals, I think in Australia they have one that went back 30,000 years ago. Wow. So, which is weird because the continent was detached 30,000 years ago. So, um, there's there's a lot of, so anytime you see burial rituals, what you're seeing there is some form of reverence for the dead. Absolutely. 
and how it's expressed, and you know, it's different everywhere. But I mean, why does a dead person need beads and a sword or a ring, the gold ring, the signet ring, the family signet ring? <laughs> right, or to be in the ground at all so that they wouldn't be eaten by animals, for example. Respect. Yeah, right, absolutely. And facing west and. Well, you know, yeah, all, oh gosh, we could we could talk for a whole hour probably about different burial rituals. rituals. Yeah, right. Go back thousands of years. Yeah, tens of thousands. Why? Of years. Yeah, I saw a hand over here. Thank yeah. you. In the animal kingdom, it makes me think of some of the stories you read about the tributes elephants pay to their dead. Okay. Yeah. By yeah. hanging around That's right. and, and uh, mourning. Mm-hmm. mourning. I was wondering, and, elephants. I don't know if dolphins. So sort of like the most intelligent of. The animal kingdom, yeah, mourn and grieve the loss. And then there's the story about the elephants, uh, the elephant whisperer story about when, when a man died, they came several miles to circle his house to pay tribute to his death. Oh, interesting, mm-hmm. interesting. And the question is, we've been deliberating on this for three thousand years, <laughs> or longer. In your, in your judgment, have, have we made any progress? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll never know. <laughs> you'll never ever know. Yes, you will. You well, know. well, and this is why I think it's <laughs> helpful to circle back to the function of afterlife beliefs. Uh, is it helpful and and wise even to um, suggest that that your loved one is in a better place? Uh, I I would have bet a lot of people have felt great comfort in those words. Uh, you know, throughout the last 3,000 years. Now, whether, now I think we, we should wrestle with the question of whether we believe that's true. Uh, but I, they certainly do provide um, functional, sort of like practical things like that. But it's a good, yeah, good question. Yes, sir. One question I call up is when does the afterlife begin? <laughs> at the moment of death or at some mass resurrection? <laughs> You'll never know. Yeah. Yes. That's a good question. So the question of timeline, uh, and we'll wrestle with that in weeks to come. That's maybe the best short answer I can give you. Know? We will raise that question. Yes. That was a great answer. It'll keep people coming That's back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 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 I can I can well, tell you better for like I mean, the New Testament period. If nineteen hundred was forty seven in America, yeah, and Jesus' time was thirty, then you're talking got to learn quick and get on with it because yeah. whatever we're doing is ending pretty soon. Right now you had a, a your, your lifespan. If you survived childhood, your lifespan was significantly. And, and in Egypt, most of your activity was building the temple to the pharaoh, which is the pyramid, right? <laughs> At least for, yeah, a certain segment of society. So they kind of yeah. went overboard on the... Life was hard and, and brutal for many, for sure. Uh, yeah, um, you know, often, you know, pharaoh is sort of like the pinnacle of society, but for, for most people, life was hard and short. What else? These are great questions and comments. What happened to all the slaves who built the pyramids? And did they have an afterlife according to the pharaoh, or did they just disappear into nothing? So, uh, certainly towards the later end of the spectrum, and I'm not an Egyptian expert, uh, my understanding is that, uh, that uh, late Egyptian history, everyone had access to access to the afterlife and their belief. Um, now, I think it's worth asking the question, we're reading the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is a source produced by the elite members who could write of Egypt. And so um, the beliefs of the elite class and the sort of the, um, the lower class don't always match up. So, and, and they don't leave records in the same way. We don't have writings of you know, Bob who was building the pyramids, because he couldn't write, he didn't have time to write. Uh, so it's all of this speculation about the afterlife and the, the remnants of it, we have our elite records, if, if that makes sense. Uh, so we have no idea what um, some of them would have believed. And I assume there's diversity of thought in their culture, just as there is in this room, right? Good. Well, one of the questions to get you through one of the gates is, is to me, pinpointing the fact that um, anybody in the military would have been, wouldn't have gotten through one of those gates because one of the questions was, did you, have you killed anybody? Right, 
Yeah. So if that's already to me pointing to the fact that the elite said, can't if you're if you're going out and killing somebody yeah. for me, you're you're off the list already. Right. <laughs> it, it raises all sorts of interpretive questions, like "Thou shalt not kill" does in our uh, our list of rules. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see, we have one minute left. Great. Yes. Let me tell you. Um, uh, I was going to say this. It's it's interesting to see how the epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, sort of um, takes Gilgamesh through the, the classic stages of grief that were developed by, or, or um, delineated by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Um, and so the myth, the epic, would have served therapeutic functions uh, and, uh, and, and is trying to teach readers how to um, accept and understand death and loss. Um, the Old Testament has deep affinities with the Gilgamesh epic. So next week when we talk about the Old Testament, We'll see that it's almost silent on the afterlife. We'll, we'll still have plenty to talk about. Uh, but it seems to imply, like the Gilgamesh epic, that the proper concern of humanity is this life, not, not the afterlife. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's a, a brief snippet, a brief <laughs> teaser. So come back next week uh, for the exciting uh, continuation. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time.